Hello and welcome to another episode of The Bike Lane. This week on the show, we're going to talk about the Armstrong lie and ask the question, what cycling story would you like to see made into a movie? Peter Sagan, he's also coming down to Australia. He'll be riding the Criterium up in Noosa. We compare Peter Sagan along with Richie Port, who'll be doing the Corporate Cycling Challenge. Plus, what's on your mind? We take a look at what's on Philip Gilbert's mind and give our view on the calendar for the season. There's the hot lap with Luke Parker flying the flag, courtesy of the Carnegie Caulfield Cycling Club, trying to get the better of David Lokes. And in the health.com.au healthy living tips, Scott McGorry tells us something we can all do, rest. Plus, Greg Henderson answers your questions. The good news is, though, that Wade Wallace has become a father. The bad news is he's not here. Some more good news is Will Walker is in the chair. Will, welcome back to the bike lane. Good to be here, Matt. And Scott, as always. Can't you're... get rid of me, can you? No, I'm trying. You were at the Melbourne to Warrnambool on the weekend where Will was the winner in 2004. You weren't the winner this year. Are you not as good as you used to be or is the standard higher? Look, there's two yeses to those two questions. <laughs> Look, yeah, part of me is not as, as good um, with endurance, but the standard of the NRS is really good. Warney was the best race. We had guys just absolutely losing it in the last 20 or 30 kilometres, going off the back everywhere. It was fantastic. I would have loved to be in the team car. You were working You were working with the VIS yeah. and you got to watch it closely. We speak a lot about the Drapak team and the Hugh and Genesis team, but the budget Fortlift squad took first, second and third. It's greedy, good wasn't it? It was a little bit greedy. Yeah. It's good to see that there's that level of tension within the racing. Yeah, look, absolutely. The, the race was very spectacular. It was uh, the crosswinds you know, did what we uh, hoped they would, blew the race apart, uh, and they were on the hands and knees. The last 50 kilometres, Will, unbelievable, the scenes. Guys just popping off the back, just completely spent. Good guys that you think could stay there. Um, it was really good to watch. Glad uh, I wasn't out there. Hugh and Genesis a little bit defensive to a tweet that Scott McGorry sent out earlier on this year with Steve Price adding a little bit of spice. He wasn't happy with you saying that somebody could challenge Hugh and Genesis. Well, it was just a story that was on Cycling News. Uh, you know, the team budget had won a couple of NRS races leading into the Tour of Murray. There was some promotion about it. Um, and they want a piece of the pie. Drapak, your boys, and uh, the Genesis guys have had most of the uh, media coverage in Australia. Budget wanted summer as well. And the Genesis guys said that, uh, no, it's all for them. So, uh, yeah, one, two, three for the Warnable, the biggest race in Australia for both. Budget really deserve it. You know, at the Warney, they took a back seat and they let Drapak battle it out with Genesis. And we both really killed ourselves. Mm. And we paid the price. And none of us really did that well in the end. And Budget came on through right at the end when the race is important and took the spot. Look, and the winner, is, the winner is cycling in Australia. Whether it's budget, Genesis, they've all had wins, Drapak this year, mm. and other teams as well, which is fantastic for the National Road Series. It shows how competitive it is, and everything's going in the right direction. And Tim Decker was a winner for a little while. There was the tweet from Cycling Australia about the intermediate sprint at the Shipwreck Coast. Mm. Tim Decker winning the sprint. Response from the Drapak team. He's sitting in the passenger seat of the U-Ride car. And a quick update from Cycling Australia. Fre refreshing the results from the intermediate sprint. Mm. Alex Morgan got a mention as well, well and he wasn't there. It was shown to me and I thought, well, oh, Tim Decker, good result. And then I saw Alex Morgan, who I'd told not to go and race. I thought, ooh, I'm not happy about that. Then read through the tweets and realised that first and second in that first sprint weren't even in the bike race. Yeah, how do you get that wrong? <laughs> <laughs> well, these things happen. We all make yep. mistakes. And on another note, we've seen in the last couple of weeks that Klaus Mueller has resigned as the president of Cycling Australia. It's Monday that we're recording this and there's a strong rumour that by the end of the week, Graham Fredericks, the chief executive of Cycling Australia, will have resigned. Hot favourite to take his spot. Perhaps Nick Green will have to wait and see, watch this space. But first up, we're going to go and have a chat with Greg Henderson. Well, Greg Henderson, he's a little bit like a lamington. He's a Kiwi, but the Aussies, we claim him and we put your questions to him. Here he is. Your wife's an Aussie, your kids are Aussies. When will you become an Aussie? <laughs> I don't think there's ever a chance of me becoming an Aussie and it's still up for debate whether or not my kids are Aussies. <laughs> are you frustrated that your wife's legs are better than yours? <laughs> oh, she will love that question, my wife. Um, am I frustrated? No, it's, it's a good sight, isn't it? Yeah. Are there times when being the lead out man, you think, nah, I'll just go for the win myself? Nah, to be honest, I am actually pretty spent by the time I get to 200 metres to go. Um, the, the one actual, you know, I was thinking about that question and uh, the one time this year was probably on the Champs-Élysées where I came on the, like on the last corner and I had 25, 30 metres and I actually tried to keep pedalling and it was just, you just can't do it, you know, you've done your work and 
normally you have, I have a big German on my wheel, so uh, um, yeah, it doesn't often enter my brain at all. So speaking of the big German, is it true that you read him a Hans Christian Andersen bedtime story each night on a grand tour? Almost correct, almost. I uh, actually just sing to him on a, a little lullaby. He, he likes the, a nice song to rock him to sleep. He prefers that. Post-race massage or red wine? A red wine while I'm having a massage. Perfect combination. <laughs> of the Kiwis coming through, who should we be watching? James Oram from uh, Bond Traeger. He's, um, he's a real talented bike rider. Him and uh, obviously the guy that won yesterday, um, A Ray, they call him, Alexander. Um, Sam Horgan, I'm not sure how old he is actually, whether he's a young gun or not, but he won Melbourne to Warrnambool, and it's, a, it's a not, not an easy task. But no, they're definitely, I've said it before, like New Zealand has the talent, it's just getting the exposure. It's actually really difficult coming from New Zealand. You know, everyone thinks to get overseas is it's just, it's just we don't have a development program like the Aussies do. So if we can get over here and kick the Aussies' ass, then that's always a good sign. In 2011, Andre Greipel won seven races. The team hires you, the next year he wins 21. Were you the difference? I would definitely say I helped for sure. And, uh, you know, I think that's pretty apparent, yeah, like, Seven to twenty-one. It's a big difference, isn't it? And uh, it wasn't just me. It was getting the team and getting the train together. You know, it was um, they sort of had didn't have a full understanding of how a lead out went. So once we got that, basically the, the lotto train on on the right rails, it was you know now it's like clockwork. Do you get as much joy out of watching him win as winning yourself? You really do. Yeah. It, honestly, that's like a lot of people ask me that, and the whole team does. You know, like you can see absolute elation at the end. You know, when he wins, it's such a nice feeling. And the burning question, are you the secret pro? <laughs> <laughs> it's no secret that I'm a pro. So Greg Henderson answering a few of the lighter questions on a more serious note, is he the best lead out man in the world? Because the easiest way to be labelled the best lead out man in the world is to lead Mark Cavendish out. Hmm. Well it was Mark but, Renshaw, wasn't it, before when he was doing that job? But it was just Mark Cavendish who was the best sprinter in the world. The job that Henderson does for Greifel, in my view, controlling the traffic, makes him the number one man. Yeah, look, I'd agree with that, but uh, Mark Renshaw might not, but he's changed teams and tried to become a sprinter, so... And what about Pataki becoming a lead-out man? That's going to be fantastic. Well, look, I had an Amiga Farm, so of course with Mark Renshaw moving across there now with Cavendish, it's going to be a really good battle between Mark and Hendy, so we'll see perhaps uh, you know, next season who is the best lead-out man. So what about your view? Who is the world's best lead-out man? Is Henderson number one? The movie, The Lance Armstrong Light, is about to hit the cinemas. It started as the story of the 2009 Tour de France, the comeback, how good could it be? And then the producer sat on it for a little while. Armstrong then went on Oprah and the movie had to get recut. I'm dying to see this movie. I think it will be fantastic. Oh, for sure. We get to, there's so much about this, this is going to be interesting and intriguing. So uh, yeah, I can't wait. Yeah, it's gone from the ultimate Rocky story to, uh, well, you know. A rocky story. As, yeah. a, as a dramatisation in Hollywood, it would be an even better story now than it was if he only just retired in 2005. Mm -hmm. But if there was another cycling story that you could see made into a movie, what would it be? Look, for me, we've had a couple of reasonable cycling movies, Breaking Away, American Breaking Flyers, um, you know, the, the Flying Scotsman, Gra yeah. Graham Mabry. But for me, the story of Fausto Coppi. It's a long time oh. ago, I know, but childhood hardship. Wins the Giro d'Italia at 20 then goes into the war for Italy, you know, with ally of, of Germany, um, prisoner of war, mm. comes back after World War II, wins Milan San Remo, wins a whole bunch of Giros, a couple of Tour de France's, world championships, adultery thrown in there, then you've got mysterious death, wrongly diagnosed and leads to his death, and only recently there were some stories out that maybe it was actually cocaine abuse. It, it's got everything. It's got it all. It ticks all the boxes. What Sounds about like you? it Will? could have as many uh, ep um, episodes as Harry Potter. Potentially, <laughs> it could. Yeah, I, I don't know if I want to see one that hasn't been produced. I'd just like to see A Road to Paris again with fresh eyes. I mean, I watched it when I was probably 12 or 13. It yeah. was the coolest thing. I knew every single line. We watch it every day after school on the rollers. Mm. And just seeing it again would actually be pretty cool. There's plenty that I'd like to see, but I won't get greedy. I'll go with just the one. I'd like to see Tyler Hamilton's The Secret Race made into a movie by Baz Luhrmann. So, Baz, I've got a job for you. Make us the movie, Tyler Hamilton's A Secret Race. Looking forward to seeing who plays the lead. 
This summer we've seen Peter Sagan come to town. He's riding the Criterium up in Noosa in association with the triathlon. And Richie Port is going to be the headline act at the Corporate Cycling Challenge. So you get the chance to either watch Peter Sagan or go for a ride with Richie Port. If you've got the cash, you can probably do both. But in terms of these two guys, very different riders, which one has impressed you more this year? Ooh, look, Peter Sagan has been extraordinary. But He's entertaining. I, he is. Like, I love his wheel stands, uh, you know, stair climbing on a bike, everything. But I can't go past Richie. I have to say Richie uh, has impressed Has me been more. more impressive. Is that because your expectations of Peter Sagan are so high? No, I just think because I'm biased. Fair enough. He's an Aussie. I'm yeah. going to support him. What about you? Oh, without bias, I would agree. Um, <laughs> I really liked what Richie did at the tour when he really was the ultimate teammate um, for Froome. Whereas Froome the year before, I didn't really like the way he played it out with Wiggins. I thought he was pretty rude, the way he looked behind, and he was really trying to make it look like a bit of a battle between the two. Whereas yeah, but it was, because he was himself. in second place overall, and Richie was out of contention. So you've both been more impressed with Richie Port. Peter Sagan for mine. His ability in the Spring Classics at 23 years of age to be so competitive, hardly ever off the podium. He wins the green jersey again at the Tour de France. He picks up another stage albeit one compared to the three that he won last year. He's only 23. That is phenomenal. The guy's going to win a bag full of spring classics in the next few years. Oh, it's certainty. So you've gone with more impressed by Richie Port. This will test them. Who would you rather be? Oh, look, I think because of the potential for Richie to win a Grand Tour, I'd stick with Richie. Despite the... I don't think Richie can do a mono. <laughs> Who would you rather be? Greg Henderson. Greg Henderson? Yeah. Because he's the world's best lead out there. Yeah. That's a big call. Well, I'd be Greg Henderson with his wife Katie's legs. Oh, now that's a good combination. I'll go with Peter Sagan because of those wheelies and purely for that reason. What about you? Who would you rather be, Richie Port or Peter Sagan? This week's edition of What's On Your Mind has been hijacked by Philip Gilbert, where we talk about what's on the former world champion's mind. And he has written an open letter stating that effectively he wants less races and he wants them to be a little less difficult. So we've brought Greg Henderson on as a current pro within the peloton to ask him whether he agrees or disagrees with Gilbert. Is he onto something? I wouldn't disagree with him, absolutely. I mean, for example, look at uh, you know, these climbs that we do in the, in the Giro and in the Vuelta, how, how steep they are for, for how long. The extreme conditions that they make us race in Milan San Remo, for example, it's like... But you were in a bus with the heater on trying to cool down. That was an easy race, wasn't it? You cut half the course short. <laughs> yeah, that was easy. That was yeah. a good day. Oh, God, that was hard to commentate. <laughs> to watch you go through, that was extreme. Yet they've added an extra climb for next year, Milan yeah. San Remo, so it'll be more difficult. Yeah. Is, is there almost like a one-upmanship competition, particularly between the organisers of the Giro and the Vuelta, as to who can have the most extreme course? It looks that way, doesn't it? You know, that, from the outside perspective, for sure. And uh, yeah, the race, they make them so long also. It's like, to have a good race, a race only needs to be 160 k's, like you get the same result yeah. after 170 k's is what you will after 230, 240. And it's better television. For the promotion of the sport, one of the challenges we've got is the, the conflict within the calendar. So we've got the Vuelta on at the same time as the two races in Canada. So if you're watching at home and you're not really into cycling, how do you know which is the one to watch? Well, we're talking about the World Tour, aren't we? So the races that actually count for the points, the overall standing in the World Tour, it's like having the Monaco Grand Prix at the same time as the Canadian Grand Prix. It's just ridiculous. They wouldn't do that. So that's something that certainly needs to change. And just the length of the first World Tour race, which is Tour Down Under in January, and through Beijing is on this week. So it's just such an incredibly long season for the riders as well. And look, let's face it, Tour Down Under, I don't want to say anything negative at all about it. It's a fantastic event. The riders love coming out here to Australia. But I don't think many of the pros want to be racing for World Tour points in January. It's just so early in the season. Would you move the Tour Down Under to February? Yeah, I think that's a great idea. And everything a little bit shorter, one event on at a time. And then the second program can be for the lesser riders in the team or the ones coming back for injury that but just not three programs on at the same time. I mean, cycling's having a bit of a crisis, so let the money sort of go to just the main events. If the Tour Down Under moved to February, in my view, it would be better for cycling globally, but worse for cycling in Australia, and definitely worse for South Australian tourism. So then what about the Grand Tours? They're the ones that attract all the attentions. And we only really see the big stars race each other at the Tour de France, because the Grand Tours are simply too hard. 
I'm of the view that we need a revolution. Let's storm the Bastille. Grand tours, Greg, I'm interested in your view on this. Grand tours, two weeks, which is 15 stages, one rest day, and it's still across three weekends. Thoughts? Well, you're right. At the moment, you, you literally cannot race to win. You can't race two Grand Tours back to back. It's not possible. So the guys that are going to win the, um, the Tour de France, they can't come and race the Tour of Spain. So they never actually get to go head to head often enough. And that's the strength of tennis, is they've got the four Grand Slams, and you see Nadal, Federer, Murray, Djokovic, etc., compete against each other at least four times per year. Mm. But cycling, we only get that chance once with the Tour de France. Mm. Well, it's not even just back to back, is it? You saw Vincenzo Nibali this year. Wins the Giro, clearly the best rider yep. there. Misses the Tour to focus on the World Championships and the Volta España. Looked like he was going to win the Volta, but then fell over because his form wasn't quite right. So he couldn't even you know, do those in the one season. So, uh, yeah. Oh, so, Greg, how long should the season be? When should it start? When should it finish? And Grand Tours, three weeks or two? Season should start and end in January. Start and end in January. <laughs> <laughs> and then I don't have to... With no pay cut. <laughs> with, with no pay cut. No, just, uh, no I mean, it's... Um, you know, we, uh, it's a good it's a good point because um, you know what did the Tour de France used to be eight eight days eight days and three thousand kilometres. You've got to evolve got to, to evolve. stay relevant. Exactly, and uh, you know there's, it's definitely a uh, food for thought, no no question. Okay, so what about you? What do you think? Do you think that the season needs to be shortened and Grand Tours? Can we reduce them down to two weeks, fifteen stages, one rest day? It's still three weekends. I'm supporting the revolution. I want to know if you're with me. Healthy Living Tips brought to you by health.com.au and Scott McGorry has caught up with Zach Dempster on something we can all do. Rest. I'm reasonably good at it. Zach is just fresh off having finished a pretty big season which has included the Volta de España. He's one of the rising stars of Australian cycling. Here's his view on recovery and rest. Welcome back to Zach Dempster, back home in Bendigo in your off-season, um, riding for Team NetApp Enduro throughout the year. First. Grand Tour finish, or first Grand Tour start and finish for this year. You must be uh, still a bit tired from that, but you're in the middle of your off-season. Let's talk about recovery. What are you doing in the off-season? What's the standard amount of time that you should have off the bike, and what have you done? Yeah, basically, most guys have around the four-week mark as their holiday period, whether they don't ride for two weeks, three weeks. Me, personally, I don't ride for three weeks, and I've just finished that now, and I'm just back on the bike yesterday to get going for the next season. Do you use the off-season to really work on what you found out through the season that maybe you're a little bit deficient in? Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. Um, at this point of the year, you are the furthest away from races that you will be for most of the season, for yeah, the whole season. So some guys take that time to really work on things. It is really important mentally to, to, to have that break. And if you want to have you know a few drinks with your friends on a Friday night, and this is the time to do it, not a week out from the world. Mm -hmm. That's the most important thing for me is mentally to let my hair down and you know, recharge the batteries for the times when you are, you know, you are alone at 2,000 metres training for the Vuelta and eating beans and rice and all those things that, you know, it's fine, I like the lifestyle, but I also do like to have chips and, you know, a few Peronis if I need it. But the season is so long now for, for you guys. You can't just have your recovery in the off season and recovery is so important. How do you target your recovery periods throughout the season? Yeah, basically it's in, in line with the races. So. Generally speaking, most guys will go for the classics, be that the Cobble Classics or the Ardennes, and then they'll either go for the, the Giro then, which follows closely after that, mm -hmm. um, or they'll have a break and then start going for, towards the, the Tour or the Vuelta or maybe the World Championship. So most guys have two peaks, and then with three, you're starting, starting to push it, I think. But um, now, now it's really important to go for that race have your break and then come up again. The last thing you want is to be a mediocre rider all season. You want to be a really good rider at certain points. So that's, that's what you see nowadays. So that recovery and actually planning it is as important, you would say, as training hard? Yeah, exactly. So physiologically, you need to let your body come down and become less fit in order for your body to reach a new level. You can't just go through your whole life getting fitter and fitter and fitter till the day you die. <laughs> so the most important thing is for the detraining aspect is to let you know, let your body recover and then you're able to go to a new level from all the work you've done before and based on the work that you're going to do as well. So rest is important and oddly enough it requires just as much discipline as training itself and in fact sometimes it's a weakness and many people will accuse you throughout the height of your career of not resting enough. Look, 
I'm, I was good at resting in my career, but I didn't have enough rest days per se. But now I've noticed the biggest difference. I'm always doing stuff. I'm doing university. I'm, last week I moved house. I've always got things on. And I can tell you the performance is a lot worse just from that. Having a full rest day with nothing to do and being 18 with your legs up on the couch, it's fantastic. It does a world of good. Because the natural inclination, if your form's not very good, is to do more. Mm. But sometimes yeah. you need to do less. Exactly. Look, if you're a professional writer like Zach, okay, all you have to think about is training, eating and sleeping and recovering. But for most of us now and, and our, our viewers, it's... Mm. OK, you want to train more, but perhaps you're working so hard, like you say, Will, that you've actually got to just slow down, do shorter sessions and rest more. Get more I've mastered the art of rest, though. <laughs> Aldo used to say something really good to me. He used to say, do everything very regular. So wake up the same time every day, go to bed the same time every day. And these guys that, you know, we talk to that are working 9 to 5, they get up at 5.30 to, to train. And I, I sometimes think that'd actually be better if they just slept in when they're tired and recovered and just did a lot of their training on the weekend because it's too hard. You're just exhausted at work and you're just getting worse. So make sure you rest enough. And next up, there's no rest. It's the hot lap. In Melbourne, there's a huge rivalry between the Carnegie Caulfield Cycling Club and the St Kilda Cycling Club. And we're settling the score on the hot lap. Last week it was David Lokes, the experienced Lokesy, flying the flag for St Kilda, who registered a time of 1 minute 22.4 seconds. This week it's Luke Parker doing the job for Carnegie Caulfield and coached by our own Scott McGrory, who's trying to better the time. But Carnegie versus St Kilda, Luke Parker, can you do better than 1 22.4? Well, I'm hoping, I mean... Uh... No, tell us, don't tell us what you're hoping. What are you going to do? Well, gonna gonna be be it? It? Yeah, let's go... 119. 119. Oh, Luke, how's the nervous tension here on the bike lane hot lap compared to the Junior World Championships with green and gold on? Um, pretty similar, I reckon. I've got tough times to beat, so you know, I'll see what I can do. Well, there's no pressure on you, mate, other than your entire club, the entire membership base of Caulfield Carnegie. 600 members. Riding on your shoulders today. Yeah, that and the fact he's got a few years on me, but uh, you know, hope that I can come up today. I'm David, last word of encouragement or disencouragement? Well, I think we've got a pretty good pedigree here, so uh, I'd be expecting a pretty good time. He's already hedging his bets on the sideline, isn't he? He's nervous. You sound like a man who's defeated, yeah. Loxy. Well, 122, I'm not sure, but uh, that's going to be quick enough to take today out. But uh, good luck, Luke, and uh, stay upright. Yeah, yeah, you sound so genuine. Let's go, Luke. We're ready for the roll down. Five, four, three... Two, one, go. Well, you didn't okay. call it a fast start. He was awake, but he doesn't have the same venom off the line as you. Though. Maybe he'll come home a little bit stronger. Very relaxed. Very relaxed. He rides for a 19 year old. He rides with a lot of high cadence, so that's, it's just, that's his routine going up the start. There. I did like a little He's comment, though, like, keep it upright. You don't really want him to, though, do you? <laughs> you want him to drop him. He has won an Oscar. A, a little, little crash around the back corner might give me that sort of five or six <laughs> seconds that I need. <laughs> Only five or six. How good uh, is he? Because this is one of our rising stars, Luke Park. Um, he's won the club championship. He's won the overall series for the uh, Glenvale Crescent Criteriums this year yeah. in Melbourne. So he's riding well. He's making the transition. It's going to take him another couple of years, though, just to get that natural strength on the road. He's been out there for a minute. He's got 22 seconds to get here. You want to go down Turn the corner, Lucy? Turn our attention <laughs> to the finish line. He's not in sight yet, I think. Oh, he's come in sight. Luke Parker. He's got 10 seconds to get here. 122.4. And Shane Kelly's getting nervous as well. The Junior World Champion representative has blown the clock away. 118.8. And it's farewell to Shane yeah. Kelly at the top of the leaderboard as well. Yeah. Luke Parker, what do you think you did, given that Shane Kelly did a 120, David Lokes did a 122? And you're a 19-year-old coming into the prime of your career, and they're old men. I don't know. The way it felt... Uh, not that flash, but... Well, I yeah. wish I felt that bad, because you did one minute, 18 seconds, point eight. <laughs> As a relief. Yeah, not bad. So have you yeah. proven again that Carnegie's the better club than St Kilda? Yeah, I think, you know, the results show, so... <laughs> oh, <look laughs> the confidence now. When you make it, will you remember us? Sure, definitely. Right, thanks for joining the bike lane. Thank you very much. So, 
It's Luke Parker who gets the better of David Lokes. Carnegie Caulfield win over St Kilda. But the desperately bad news is that Luke Parker was not quicker than our very own Scott McGrory. Will, if you were VIS athlete beaten by VIS coach, how would that go down? That, that would go down very badly. But in saying that, ex-Olympian, and we know he still trains quite a lot, probably more than a lot of you know, current riders. Ergo session this morning. Yeah. yeah that's one ergo session. And, but Luke Parker, he's a good bike rider. He's won the Austral. He's represented Australia at the Junior Worlds. And he's a big talent for the future. Yeah, he looks like the complete package. He looks perfect on the bike. He's fast. He looks like he will be able to climb one day with a little bit more training. He's, he's just going got to be broken a good morale. Keep it going. Keep it going. He's an exceptional bike rider. Yeah, he's just Parker. got broken morale yeah. because he was beaten by his coach. Can we? You on the hot lap? No, I'm out. If Luke Parker can't can't beat Scott, then there's no way I'm even putting my stuff up. I'm Come good on, on that circuit. I've won a few crits around that circuit, but. The hot lap, no chance. We've got a plan. Greg Henderson, we really appreciate you being on the show, but we need one more favour, and it's a big one. Three days before you leave to go back to Europe when you're in really good condition, please come back and do the hot lap and pull Scott McGrory's pants down. And you need to help us and lobby Greg Henderson. I think he'll beat you. I'm sure he will. That's why I think he should do it the day after he gets back from his holiday in Port Douglas, probably wearing scuba gear. No, it's not going to happen. Greg, come and do the hot lap and you have to help us lobby Greg Henderson. Speaking of Greg, thanks to Shifter Bikes for hosting the interview with Greg. And as always, Malachi at Northside Wheelers for hosting the show as well. Plus, don't forget Movember. Looking forward to discovering where I can or cannot grow a moustache. And Wade, he might be back next week. He's a new father. In the meantime, Will, thanks for filling in. Pleasure to be here. Scott, as always. Oh, I love it. And next week, we're looking forward to hearing from you. Comment on all the things we've spoken about. Plus, don't forget, tell us what's on your mind. We look forward to discussing it next week.